Thanks so much for joining us here today. My name is Kevin. I'm a senior in the college studying economics and political science. I'm the president emeritus and alumni chairman, or just some dude, um, with uh, CORE. Um, CORE is the Columbia Organization of Rising Entrepreneurs. Uh, we're the Cross University Student Entrepreneurship Group, although I think at heart we are an undergraduate student group. Um, and we're excited this year to have seen our membership grow uh, to over 2,100 students um, and to have over 1,800 uh, fans on Facebook. Um, so what we really believe we're doing here is building a community and inspiring, educating, and launching the next generation of entrepreneurs from Columbia. Two years ago, um, I and some other members on the team, um, and I, I think many other people independently throughout the university, um, were thinking about how there's a real lack of a cross-university extraordinarily large uh, sort of venture competition. Uh, many other schools had it at the time, many other schools still do have it at the time. Um, and uh, we wanted to try and change that. Um, and for those of you who don't know, CORE has an annual budget this year of $300. Um, <laughs> so we're bootstrapping it. Um, <laughs> uh, and so we knew that while there was incredible student excitement for this kind of event, um, we didn't have the resources alone to do it. Um, and I think um, this year, um, we've been lucky enough that the university and Columbia Entrepreneurship specifically, goodness, um, has really stepped up um, and helped and launched kind of this competition, the Startup Columbia Challenge. Um, this will be the first time that we're giving away $50,000 um, to teams from across the university, many of them from many different schools coming together, many different disciplines and backgrounds. And so we're incredibly excited about that. And I think it really um, is par with the course for entrepreneurship this year, which is that on one hand, there's a rising incredible student energy and interest and willingness to put in work and to and create brilliant and amazing things. And on the other, we've had brilliant, exciting, um, amazing collaborative partners on the part of the university that's made this happen today. So um, what I'd love to do is to really quickly give you an outline of the competition. I'd love to introduce our judges. Um, I'd love to briefly mention the teams. And then I have two exciting opportunities that I want to share with you um, for you to get involved in some way as well. Um, the, just a quick, quick, quick introduction of the judges. Um, so we have uh, Shazi Vistram uh, from Happy Family. She spoke um, earlier today. Um, she's on a work call. As you know, it's, it's, entrepreneurship is a time-consuming and difficult thing. You can never surely tell. Um, so hopefully she'll be rejoining us in just a few minutes. Um, Aaron Harris is a partner at Y Combinator. We're excited to have him. Um, CZ Chang is a director of the Dorm Room Fund with First Ground Capital. Uh, Peter Zing is a managing director at Maris Capital. Uh, we have a different uh, MD with us today, uh, um, uh, Adler, per Adler Perot, um, who is faculty in bioinformatics um, and a director of Health Tech Assembly. First team is 118 Capital. Thanks, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Columbia University for putting this great event together. Um, and thank you, CORE, for hosting. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to be the first presenter. And my organization, 118 Capital, of which I'm president, uh, has a particular interest in seeing good entrepreneurs succeed. I'm going to tell you about that. 118 Capital believes that innovative entrepreneurs can solve real economic problems that have to do with social and environmental challenges. We exist to find, mentor, and assist social enterprises aiming to measurably improve living standards for underprivileged groups in the US and Latin America. We're creating a platform to build student experiences founded in practical uh, experience that can add value for social entrepreneurs and the investors with which we partner them. It's our hope through our platform that student fellows coming through 118's program will take the values that we inspire in them forward into whatever career they choose to pro progress with. 118 Capital was founded by a group of students from the Columbia Impact Investing Initiative, 10 of us across the business school and the policy school. In our two years at school, our team collectively worked on 20 pro bono consulting projects, engaging 200 students in those two years. 
Time and again, what we found at the bottom of our work was that the real challenges that the social enterprises with which we were working are facing have to do with a lack of the right type of early stage capital and a lack of the technical skills that are needed for them to grow their business. 118 Capital's mission is to address those two gaps. To do that, we bring two things to the table. First, we provide early stage loans and equity investments into companies that are sourced and selected by our 118 student fellows. Any investment is vetted with our investment committee. Follow up to our investment, we help our entrepreneurs raise additional capital and we reinvest any proceeds that we're able to generate from successful investments into our organization to be used for future investment. We've developed and continued to refine a standard model to channel a vast amount of student interest into quantifiable impact for our entrepreneurs and their investors. Currently, we're undergoing a process to codify and package our model so that we can share that with member groups across other universities. We're developing a track record. Last spring, we presented our launch at Columbia University and announced that we would raise $50,000 and make a first investment within our first year. Proud to say that we've been able to do that with the help of 90 donors, 100% of our board funding, 40 enterprises were screened with 20 MBA and M MPA students, and we're now investing in a, uh, an ethical fashion design company here in New York and an educational application developer to fight truancy in US schools. To move forward and do more of this activity, we need a financially sustainable plan, which is something we've worked a lot on at 118 Capital. Over the next five years, we intend to reduce our reliance on philanthropic donations in order to make room for strategic earned revenue approaches to managing our business. We include mem a growing membership base and uh, successful impact investment activities as sources of future revenue. To give you a perspective on this market, in 2012 and 13, JP Morgan estimated that $17 billion globally was committed to impact investing. Another research study by Village Capital shows that of all of the impact investing market, only 3% is allocated to investments under the size of $250,000. There's a clear gap in the early stage financing of these enterprises, and we have an opportunity to create meaningful experiences for students while we fill that gap. Our goal over the next five years is to raise one and a half million dollars, which will be deployed into 50 social enterprises that are selected by 100 118 student fellows across 10 member groups. In 2014, our goal is to raise $100,000 we're looking at Startup Columbia funding to be a portion of that so that we can make an additional two to four investments towards the end of this year. It's a challenge to do this on our own, so we've developed a team to help guide us, including industry professionals from a range of areas. Our group is intentionally diverse, men, women from over seven countries um, with, again, a broad range of backgrounds and ultimately the goal to help us identify the real global issues that we need to address and to help us select the right entrepreneurs to do that. Thank you. I have a question. So you mentioned uh, financial sustainability and moving away from um, having to constantly solicit uh, philanthropic donations and instead have a membership. Um, who will those members be and, and, why, and why would they be putting in money? What are they looking for? That's a great question. Um, so the two strategic areas I mentioned were members and impact management. Uh, the members are going to be other top universities in the US and Latin America 
five of which have already reached out to discuss what we're doing, how they can be involved, how we can collaborate. Uh, as I mentioned, we are packaging the process from start to finish that we've developed over the course of the last year and a half as somewhat of a product for the other groups who will become member funds. Um, additionally, as we grow, we'd like to use other strategic initiatives to bring private capital to the table alongside our philanthropy. Very, uh, very noble cause. <clears throat> Uh, my question is, how will you pro source your projects? Sourcing projects. That's a good question. Um, everyone who's had an interest in 118 has told us that the most important thing we can do is have interesting, unique projects that'll be around. So we've gone out to conferences. We've built partnerships with initially seven organizations that, e that work with and support early stage businesses. Um, we've used grassroots, word of mouth. We take all calls, we don't ever turn anyone away. Um, at the end, we do focus our efforts on entrepreneurs who are identifying real, tangible, important problems. Um, and so we partner with groups that have those interests in mind. I'm a little confused um, about the way that you've structured your return targets and how that leads into actually becoming a self-sustaining business. Sure. Um, and also how you're comparing yourself to venture funds where it seems like what you're doing is more accurately more around loans. Um, I mean, in order to get venture returns or that kind of return, you have mm -hmm. to expect these businesses either to exit or to buy you out at some point. So how do you see that actually playing out on the exit side? And how much do you actually expect to generate in order for this to be self-sustaining? Yeah, so for us to become self-sustainable, we are looking at down the road developing somewhat more of a venture model where we actually raise funds that are geographic and impact specific and where 118 will manage those funds after we've demonstrated a successful track record with our loan program for a small fee, hopefully more modest than the traditional VC industry, to fund the ongoing operations of 118. That money will then be reinvested into future funds and fund a small portion of our operations. And where do you see the return of capital coming from? Because it sounds like the, the businesses you want to back definitely need to get back, they need to get built, but they're rarely the type that will exit to provide liquidity. So right. how do you actually envision uh, pulling capital back out to give to you new, new, new businesses? No, that's a good question. Um, again, these the equity investments that we'll make are relatively long term. So in the, in the shorter term, we are focusing on having a liquid loan portfolio that has short time horizons so that we can turn over capital that will be reintroduced into our fund with some interest. Thank you very much. So I'm Javier, this is Frank. And today, we're gonna talk to you about a product that is revolutionizing how Guatemalans buy, sell stuff, and find jobs. Colombia, Barnard, meet Ayalo. Ayalo is the first mobile classified service for the masses. We help anyone with a phone buy and sell stuff and find jobs. It works even if you don't have a smartphone and even if you don't have money on your prepaid phone. Now let me tell you why this is very important. It turns out that classifieds, as ubiquitous as they might be in the US, are not in Latin America. And this is simply because while there are more than 500 million mobile users, less than 100 million have regular internet access. How can this be possible? Well, over 70% over 70% of mobile users do not have a smartphone, and 80% of mobile users are prepaid and don't have any money on their phone. This doesn't allow them to access an efficient marketplace and creates a broken market for over 400 million. So what do people do when access to information is still a luxury? I want you to meet Don Wenceslao, He's a coffee farmer from Guatemala. 
And without those, if he wants to sell his motorcycle, he has three options. Print classifieds, which are expensive. Computer classifieds, which don't work when most people don't have a computer. And mobile classifieds, which are inaccessible when they don't work for phones like this. And even if they do, they are not free. In an era where we can Snapchat our cat, not having ubiquitous access to classifieds, it's ridiculous. And this is why we created Ayalo. Now let me tell you how we make classifieds ubiquitous. First of all, Ayalo works on every device. If you don't have a browser, you can text to post or to view an ad. If you have a basic phone, like 60% of Latin Americans, you can also use it. And it works on smartphones. Most importantly, it is truly free. Through our partnerships with the telcos, we have managed to get free browsing and free texting. It is free to post and to view ads. And we have created an internal messaging system so that it's free for you to chat with other people. So now let me talk about the million dollar question, where is the money? And let me tell you about it. On the one side, we create a digital marketplaces that reaches members of the informal economy, an economy that globally represents $10 trillion. On the other side, we become a direct advertising channel for this market that up until now, companies have been spending on traditional advertising in emerging markets over $160 billion. We unite the two. We are going to disrupt traditional advertising and redirect a large chunk of that money into Ayalo. This allows our users to have an amazing service for free and allows companies to spend less money. How do we make money? Well, first of all, for people that want to get better results, we will charge for premium placements on our service. For companies that want to advertise with us, we will charge for banner ads. And since we know our users' preferences and have their phone number, we will charge for lead generation. This allows us to make 91 million and allows companies to get 1 million results, what they used to pay for, for only 80,000. So how have we done so far? We launched in December, we spent less than $500 in ads, and we have 33,000 unique users. What's most impressive is that 45% of our users are coming back every week. Remember that this is a classified service. How have we made this possible? Well, we partner up with two of the biggest telcos in Guatemala. They give us access to their user, and in return, we provide them with users' preferences and information. This allows us to offer our service for free and to use their distribution channels to offer our service. Once we monetize, we plan to use our revenue to subsidize for users' data costs so that they don't have to pay for that. Now, a couple of other things that we have done in order to get more users is use mobile ad networks and also direct marketing to micro communities such as universities and local stores. All of these efforts are really worthless if we are not really creating and making users happy. That's why more than a classifieds, what we're doing is we're creating local marketplaces and connecting people in a better way. So let me tell you three quick stories about the many that have happened on Ayala. About 15 days ago, farmers started to use our service to sell their produce. Just about a month ago, we got an ad and we managed to get 15 people a job in less than an hour. And if you remember Don Wenceslao, well, he sold his bike to Miguel here. Um, so this is a revolution that is already taking place in Guatemala. And I am here to invite you to join me on bringing this revolution to the rest of Latin America. We are looking for investors and for sexy ninjas to join our team. <laughs> Thank you.
Great, great presentation. Um, your mobile UX is already better than Craigslist's uh, mobile UX. Sorry? Your, your mobile UX is already better than Craigslist's <laughs> mobile UX. Thanks. So congrats on that. You, you cut two deals with the carriers in Guatemala. Will you have to cut similar deals with all the other wireless carriers to get that yes. South American yes. coverage? And that's why we created uh, our, our engine of growth is to provide them with user intelligence in return for their users. So they send users to our platform, and in return, based on the actions that they take, we tell them what they're looking for and their preferences. Wireless carriers are notoriously difficult to work with. So congrats, congrats on uh, securing the... Thank you. And I mean, we already have a deal with Claro, which is the biggest one in Latin America. So it's a door to get to the rest. How did you get those initial deals? Sorry? How did you get those initial deals? Well, um, we know my brother has a, a mobile, not a mobile carrier, but provides services to uh, mobile carriers. So we managed to get a deal, uh, an introduction to the, to the carriers through that. And the deal with Claro, it starts in Guatemala, but does it extend to the rest of Latin America? It's the first step to it. I'm, we're working with another aggregator in Mexico right now and they're getting another introduction for us in, in Mexico. Got it. Um, so you, classifieds are obviously a really large sector. Um, are you focusing on one specific type of classified? I mean, you mentioned jobs, you mentioned selling bikes, you mentioned selling produce. Is there a focus that you have initially? Like, what's the deepest, what is the worst itch that you're gonna scratch first, or are you going general to capture as many people as possible? I mean, as of now, we have seen the biggest pain points in jobs. And another one that is pretty big is dating. Dating? Yeah. Personals. <laughs> That's why we're looking for the sexy ninjas. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would think that one of the things you should think about is focusing on one of those verticals. Because you'll find that if you try to do things for all the people at different times, they have completely different needs and completely different like systems of interaction with your platform. So if you focus on one of them, you'll actually figure out how to be super, super useful to everyone. It's probably jobs, because um, that's the thing that everyone wants and no one can find. That's true. That's something that we're already building right now. Um, so people can upload their basic CV through our platform in order to get to that. Um, but really good point, thanks. Can you tell me a little more about your, your expansion plans over the course of the next year, um, both in terms of geographically where you plan to go, you mentioned Mexico, and then also um, your team. Uh, you know, what, what are the new people you want to bring on? What, sorry? Did I, what I are the new uh, team members you want to bring on over the course of the next year? Okay. So in terms of expansion right now, we're really focused on generating volume and a really solid product that solves people's problems. So. Uh, for the next four months, we're going to heavily focus on Guatemala, and we're going to finish the product there and conquer the classifieds market. After that, we're going to expand to Mexico, and that's our year plan, uh, because that's, that's already a, a big, big market. Right now, we're a team of five. We're planning on growing it to eight over the next four months. Great presentation. Um, Given that the, uh, the, the telcos are the gateway um, for you to your customer base, are you concerned at all about them forming direct competition to you? I mean, at the beginning we were, but then as we started working with them, we saw that they're very inefficient at innovating, that's one. But the other point, and which is more important, is the fact that if one carrier focuses, they, they only have, they have less than, than half of the market. So putting up a, a branded product, they're not really accessing everyone. What are, um, what are smartphone adoption rates like in Latin America? So right now um, in Guatemala, it reached that the real number, because all of the numbers are kind of all over the place. In Guatemala, we reached 18% last year. And it's estimated that it's around 30%. But the bigger problem Wait, it's, gro it's growing 30% a year? Uh, growth rates. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because what, what I'm wondering about is, like, the things you're saying make a ton of sense, um, but how do you deal with the fact that, I don't know, in five years, everyone will have a smartphone? That's a good point. It's, es it's, it's estimated that in five years, 50% of Latin Americans will have a smartphone. But the key thing here is that 80% are prepaid and don't have money on, and spend most of their time without any money. So that's, that's the real thing. 
Even if they have a smartphone, they won't be able to access it all the time. Hello? Yep. Okay. Hi, everybody. Sorry for that. My name's Douglas. This is Atif. Jeremy and Gavin are over there in these fetching orange polos, and we are the Fuel Logic team. We're here because airlines load too much unnecessary fuel into their aircraft, needlessly increasing the weight of the planes and burning money on every single flight. Fuel Logic is the solution to that problem. Let's start with the big picture. The airline industry has extremely thin margins. Fuel costs are 35% of operating costs. It's $40 billion a year. One of the easiest ways to bring this down is actually pretty simple. Reduce the weight of your plane. And airlines are absolutely fanatical about this. These blue circles represent the relative weight of some of the things that airlines have paid to achieve, weight reductions. They've purchased new food carts to shave off 17 pounds. They've handed their pilots iPads to re reduce the weight of all the heavy paper charts they have to carry around. American Airlines even makes its own in-flight magazine, American Way, financially justify its way onto the plane, and this thing weighs ounces. One big opportunity that airlines have ignored up until now is this big orange circle, discretionary fuel. Fuel logic is after that opportunity. So what is discretionary fuel? Well, Prior to takeoff, every pilot gets on the phone with their dispatcher. The majority of the fuel load that they talk about is fixed. It's set by the FAA, and it's set according to the route that the air, uh, pilots take and the plane they're flying. It also includes built-in contingency fuel in the event of weather delays or an emergency. But on every plane, every pilot will say, you know what, give me a little extra fuel. That's the discretionary purchase, and it can range from half a percent to five percent of the total fuel load. The, important thing is that the pilot has no information, no data, no analytics that are helping him make this decision. It's purely an experienced judgment call. So how do you solve this problem? Fuel Logic is a mobile application for the pilot's tablet. It brings in publicly available weather data and other conditions. It brings in pri airline proprietary data on historic fuel usage per flight and combines them together as a hub of information for the pilot creates a closed feedback loop so the pilot knows exactly if the decision he's making is the right one or not. Atif now is going to talk a little bit more about the product. Thanks, Doug. Now let's take a look at what the pilot sees when he sees Fuel Logic on his tablet. First, he opens up Fuel Logic and sees uh, the diagram on the top left, so the upcoming flight the current flight, as well as the route explorer, if he wants to explore beyond his current flights. Uh, second, he sees more information about uh, the particular flight that he's currently on, uh, including taxi time and traffic time, which are certain things that, in our conversations with the pilots, they consider very important in their fuel-making decisions, but don't have that information on their fingertips. And the last thing that they see, most importantly, is the fuel analysis, um, which allows us to utilize all the information that Doug talked about to come up with the optimal amount of contingency fuel that a pilot should take. So here are a few things that our potential customers have said about reducing fuel weight and our product in general. We're really excited that our potential customers are looking at ways to optimize fuel because that's exactly what Fuel Logic does. What's really interesting about the aviation market is how consolidated it is. So currently in the United States, there are about five major carriers that hold a 90% market share. Meanwhile, in Europe, the same number hold about a 50% market share. So all it takes is one sale to one of these major carriers to convince the others that Fuel Logic is a product that they should also be considering. The market size is incredibly attractive. In the United States alone last year, there were six million departures. Together, they burned about 90 billion pounds of fuel. Discretionary fuel accounted for one billion of those pounds. And in our conversations with airline operations executives, we feel confident that Fuel Logic can reduce that amount by about 20%, resulting in a very conservative estimate of $80 million of savings amongst the US major carriers alone. And when you include the European major carriers you mentioned, about $240 million of savings. It's also important to note that 
fuel logic can also be used by other major global carriers outside these two target regions, as well as regional carriers. And beyond that, fuel logic can be customized for things like cargo planes, private planes, and trucking, basically any industry where fuel matters. So our business model is pretty straightforward. We're looking for a per pilot subscription based fee. Um, based on our initial market analysis, um, we're targeting $350 a pilot annually. This creates a recurring revenue model that's scalable both by airline as well as by region. Currently, there's no competition in this sector, and we're looking to uh, leverage that by being first to market and be able to um, continue and get a critical market share. Um, in that vein, uh, we have a provisional patent pending for our software, and we have a JetBlue manager as a member of the FuelLogic team. Over the coming months, we're planning on rolling out a uh, testing partnership with JetBlue. So all in, FuelLogic helps pilots make smarter refueling decisions and helps airlines stop burning so much money and start saving hundreds of millions of dollars on their operational costs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I understand the calculations having to do with the fuel savings uh, and $80 million in fuel savings, but that doesn't seem to actually be your market. Um, if, you, if you're on a subscription basis for the number of pilots in the U.S., then how big do you think your actual market is? Yeah. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, so there, I, I'm at JetBlue, by the way. Um, we have about 2,200 2, pilots, uh, and we're 5% of the U.S. market. So you can extrapolate from there. But to, just to talk about the revenue model, we came up with a 350 off of uh, the charting service that has just made its way onto flight decks and iPads is $175 uh, a year per pilot. And that's just basic charts that are required. Uh, you have to carry those. That's what the, the airlines that took the weight off the aircraft have put those onto iPads. So we're trying to leverage the fact that iPads just made it into the, into the cockpits. And at 350, uh, and our, uh, our average pilot flies about 350 flights a year, so we're looking at they have to save $1 for, per flight to pay for itself. And for context, a JFK to Los Angeles is about $18,000, $19,000 in gas today. My first reaction is, holy crap, they haven't figured this out yet. Fuel? Are you serious? No wonder the business sucks. Um, We've been trying to consolidate and get a little better on the revenue side. Have you, have you done back testing now that you have uh, JetBlue data back testing? It, had you implemented Fuel Logic over the last year, how much would JetBlue have saved? So we don't have complete data from JetBlue yet. Um, we're looking to get that in the coming months um, as we're exploring a test partnership with them. Um, but from conversations with pilots and dispatchers, we think that the 20% um, and, and the model that we've built out on the revenue side is sustainable. You asked about um, in the prior year. This idea was generated, I think, uh, two, two months ago. So we're still in the early stages. And uh, we've had conversations with all aspects of flight, from dispatchers to line pilots to flight management to people that uh, to, to our technology management. And, and uh, all of them independently have uh, bought into the idea of testing this. I, I do believe that if one airline uh, adopts it, they all will. Uh, what's interesting is it doesn't necessarily mean higher profits for the entire industry because there, you don't change the basis of competition, right? Everyone's gonna, uh, those cost savings will basically accrue to the ticket pricing, which again, goes back to negative uh, margins in the, in the business. Right, so, I mean, there's been a transformation certainly in the US space over the last couple of years. Anybody who's, who's followed has seen the mergers, but I, I wanna focus on the, the technological aspect. Um, American Airlines introduced Sabre. They, they created Sabre in the 80s and actually spun it off. And Sabre basically processes over 90% of all ticket reservations in the world today, as well as do a host of crew products and other flight management products. On the chart side, a company known as Jeppesen is responsible for nearly, I'd say basically the same amount, 90% of all charts. So what we see in this space is a couple of, of technology companies, either created by Boeing in the case of Jeppesen or American in the case of Sabre, control the entire space. And what we're really trying to leverage here is only been two years since iPads and other tablets have made it onto flight decks. There was a lot of legwork to get the FAA uh, and EASA in Europe to approve that, and so no one has been able to, to provide data to pilots. It hasn't existed. 
Um, so first of all, thank you for wearing orange shirts. It, it makes me feel like I'm at home. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to work through the numbers a little bit. Um, so if you charge 300 bucks a month, um, a year. Uh, oh, it's 300 bucks a year. So that means your actual market, if you get all of the pilots, is how much, like $10 million a year? Is that how much you'd earn? Yeah, in the, U in, in the US alone, but that's just one market. Okay, and so how much larger yep. is the rest of the world? Um, so if you fact, the European and Asian markets are just as large, um, if you extrapolate, but that's just the, major, sorry, it's just the major carriers that we're yeah. talking about in this analysis. Um, if you add in the, all the regionals, I think you said the, um, th that's, th you, can, you can, I think, double the, um, the uh, market size for pilots, um, flights that aren't just co-shared. Um, so, so total revenue would probably be about $20 million a year? No, no. so it's 30 with just the majors, 30. and then double that for the, for the world. Okay, thanks guys. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we are game plan, uh, cloud-based construction management tool. Uh, we are all affected by the design and construction around us. We all ride subways and we hate when there are regular delays or changes in schedule because of the repair and maintenance. Um, and hard on taxpayers' money are spent on funding some of the largest construction projects like Eastside Access and the World Trade Centers. I've worked in some of the largest construction projects in New York City, Eastside Access, like this, where the cost overrun is expected to be 180% and the delay of seven years. United Nations headquarters where the cost delays was 120%. And the main reason I found for such problems and inefficiency is the lack of collaboration between the project managers and the construction workers on the site. Uh, the construction uh, softwares currently in the market are very extensive and expensive in, to train. And there are softwares that don't talk to each other. So companies have to use multiple softwares uh, to do multiple tasks and still use, they still use paper-based communications to transfer data uh, with each other. And there is no real-time communication uh, between the site and the office, and there is a lack of collaboration at that stage. Um, my friend Vishal here also was facing the similar problem and decided to come up with a solution one and a half year ago uh, as a game plan to provide a centralized platform for all the team members in the construction to work together and uh, collaborate together. So, so uh, hello guys, uh, myself Vishal. Uh, game plan uh, basically a cloud, is a cloud-based uh, tool for architects, engineers, and uh, construction management uh, people to come together on one platform and collaborate and use our business intelligence and predictive analytics tools to run their business processes and uh, uh, make uh, informed decisions. Uh, they can uh, uh, socialize with their uh, uh, team members on a given project, so it's a project-wide uh, social network. Uh, we make uh, office-to-field communi communication easier and more effective like no other tool. We have iPad applications, Android apl applications, and then we are uh, going uh, uh, platform agnostic. Uh, we automate notifications, reminders, and warnings, uh, uh, and we run algorithms to actually find out like uh, what is more important. And uh, 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 we built uh, mobile solutions for uh, field reporting and again office to field communication. Uh, so uh, field reporting, quality control, and uh, safety, uh, construction safety. Uh, we use. Uh, 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 our uh, uh, scheduling tool uh, where everybody on the uh, project, like whether it's be, being uh, a architect or in, uh, engineer, not be even a scheduler, everybody come together, collaborate, plan together, give each other feedbacks, and uh, uh, really, you know, uh, b become like bring everything, like scheduling and planning process uh, in a collaborative uh, uh, platform. Uh, and. Uh, 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 we put together uh, uh, a, a tool just like Box and Dropbox, by the way. We integrate with Box and Dropbox, but it, uh, you, they where people can share documents and they can share uh, their comments, feedbacks, and uh, we are integrating with uh, Box and Dropbox as well because we, we have seen a lot, lot, lot of people uh, adopting Box and Dropbox in the industry right now for this particular purpose. Uh, 
we wrote algorithms to identify where the most attention of this construction and uh, engineering professionals is needed. And uh, we uh, help like, uh, them optimize resources using that. We, uh, we put together business intelligence and predictive analytics tools and algorithms uh, to, uh, so people can make informed decisions. We, they are saved by information overload and we, they, they just get enough information uh, when and where they need it. Uh, so far, uh, we actually launched our beta version in August 2013. So far, we have 800 beta users, uh, and uh, uh, we are growing at a rate of 13% every month. Uh, we look forward to put right marketing budget in place and uh, reach up to 33% uh, average uh, growth rate for next uh, uh, three years, and uh, uh, reach up to 27,000 users by December 2015. The 7.5 trillion global market of construction has unlimited opportunities, and the construction companies are fast adapting to technology. And there are, uh, just in New York, we have $750 million opportunity for SaaS in construction. Um, in a competitive landscape, Game Plan provides a centralized platform like none other uh, competitors out there. Um, our business model is, is uh, SaaS in construction, and we have like we expected to have 100 users by the end of April. Uh, we have a, a pilot project in Phoenix and in Seattle, uh, and in, also we have a lead in China, uh, the next big construction market. Uh, we expect to close um, in 2014 with $300,000, uh, growing at the rate of 43 percent, and closing 2015 at 5.7 million, and 2016 with 37 million. But our vision just doesn't stop there. We're bringing virtual reality into construction through Google Glass, and uh, we're, bring, we're bringing hardware solution to construction overall, actually. So game plan saves time, money, and safety in construction. Thank you. So you mentioned you have um, 800 beta users currently. Um, can you tell me a little more about how, how they're using the, the platform? What does engagement look like? You mentioned a lot of features. We'll just love to understand, you know, what are they most active on? So uh, these 800 beta users are basically 800 different com companies. Uh, they are coming from, uh, like, 40 different countries, and they, they use, like, one or the other uh, tool in our system. They do not use the entire system at, uh, at, at present. But, the, but we see a huge potential uh, of this thing going, like the entire thing implementing on one project. And that's what we are doing with two projects in Phoenix and Seattle right now. So it's like we, we got 100 users who are like using everything that we have. So, but do you, are they, are they, do they come, do they come to game plan every day, every hour? How often are so, they engaging? Uh, so these 800 beta users uh, basically uh, use uh, maybe a task management tool, tool inside the tool. So it, they come like maybe every two days, three days. And uh, some of them actually, we have churn rate as well. So some of them tried it, they used it for some time, and they used a particular part of it, and they don't use it anymore. We don't make everything available to everybody so it, uh, like, uh, un like so far to all, all 800 users, like the business intelligence and predictive analytics part. Uh, we are only doing with the pilot projects. Do you need to integrate into any other construction management software? Sorry? Yes. Do you need to integrate into yes. ERP, uh, we, Autodesk, we whatever? Yes. We have so, features, so anybody can import data from whatever they're using right now, from Excel, from MS Project, or AutoCAD, or whatever they're using, they can bring in their data to us and actually use our software. So, uh, so uh, actually, uh, do you, can you just go back? So, we basically, uh, have uh, uh, this uh, import and export uh, uh, for uh, data in Primavera, Oracle Primavera and MS project. And uh, we are going forward with this integration approach and following all the standards in the industry. Like uh, there is a big movement going, like building smart alliances, putting together standards, like industry foundation classes and everything else, AGC, XML, AEC, XML. Last question. And we are bringing information in those formats. Is, is there any way you can price it such that you capture some of the you know, 100%, 180% cost overrun. That would make it far more interesting than $6,000 a year per team. Oh yeah, so uh, so uh, right now, what uh, our projection for $6,000 per user per month, uh, like average, 
it's uh, for the pilot projects where we learn from these companies as well as we go and we work with them hand in hand to really you know uh, be make bring value to them uh, like our competitors right now are uh, some of them like part of it the part of game plan actually ha includes like data entry uh, forms and everything so uh, we are not only about data entry like not just changing paper into electronic but actually bringing all data and analyzing it so uh, they they charge anywhere between 25,000, 50,000 bucks, and some of them go as high as 70,000, and then... But if you claim you can help reduce the cost overrun substantially, then there seems to be a value exchange mismatch. Definitely, definitely. By reducing rework and by making like everything productive, like construction industry like is going down. Productivity is going down in construction from last 40 years now. So technology has to solve it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alana, and this is Allison, and we are Leoa, with you for the long run. So picture this situation, and men, you're going to have to pretend you're women for a second. So you're on your way to work, and you're in a really big rush, and you look down only to find a massive run in your pantyhose. So you go back to the nearest store and buy another pair only to find that this pair wears just a few wears later. This causes you to spend a lot of money and results in a lot of frustration. And in addition, we're seeing a trend in the industry for women to want to look more feminine. Well, we have the solution. Leoa, the new non-run, non-slip branded pantyhose to completely disrupt the pantyhose industry. So say goodbye to pantyhose and say hello to Leos. We're calling these Leos to disassociate the negative connotation women have with pantyhose. They will come in basic shades of nudes and blacks and will be with you for the long run. So first and foremost, using our special Leonit technology, which we will trademark, these pantyhose will be guaranteed not to run. And secondly, we'll have non-slip shoe grips on the bottom of the soles to prevent your feet from slipping in heels. Women find it very uncomfortable when wearing pantyhose with heels because your feet slip forward, and we'll seek to patent this element. Last but not least, we seek to make this experience very simple for women. So we're going to provide them with a machine mesh washable bag, which will be bright pink and branded with the Leoa logo to ensure our brand remains at the top of consumers' minds. The current market is very fragmented. There's no other products out there like Leoa. And in addition, they don't last, and there's no brand loyalty in the industry. And we have spoken with over 200 potential customers who believe in this product. Right now, they're spending, on average, $80 per year on basic tights alone. And in addition, when we've pitched our product to them, 90% said they'd be willing to buy our product over the competitors in the market. So in doing so, we're going to change and disrupt the industry as we know it. We're going to make this purchase process from a not thoughtful last-minute decision to a more thoughtful and planned-out decision. So given the preponderance of the problem that Alana described, we see a lot of market potential here. So we've identified, <laughs> we've identified at least 63 million women who would buy our product. And if we only take 1% of that market at our price point, that translates to 30 million in revenue. So how are we gonna reach these customers? Well, primarily it'll be via our website in which we sell directly to customers and we're gonna offer a subscription model where every season customers receive five core styles. We're also gonna make partnerships with corporations in, in, in pantyhose prevalent industries such as restaurants and airlines, thereby locking in the employees as customers. We believe strongly that the way to get the word out about Leoa will be via key influencers such as the top women's wear bloggers and also by going to industry conferences and making partnerships with complementary industries. So not only are we going to change what women expect of pantyhose, we're going to change the way they experience them by making an entirely new branded experience that does not exist currently in the market. It will be defined by our exceptional customer service, trust in our product, and also a close relationship between us and our customers. We're also going to offer rewards and referral programs and further incentivize our customers. We see Leo growing in several ways via mass market, mass retailers, home shopping, expanding into new features, other products such as socks and undergarments. 
So when speaking with potential customers, we've defined our optimal price to be $25 per pair. And in speaking with uh, potential manufacturers, we've estimated the cost per pair to produce to be $5 all in. This gives us an 80% margin. And more importantly, looking at the cost per wear. So currently, if a customer buys pantyhose at a convenience store, it's costing them roughly $4 per wear. And even worse, at department stores, it's about $7.50 per wear. With Leo's, customers will only be spending roughly 50 cents or less per wear. And Leo is going to grow fast. We estimate that by year five, we'll reach $6.5 million in revenues and $2.5 million in cash flow, which we have more detailed assumptions about our underlying, underlying numbers. And we've done some sensitivity analysis around the cost per unit. And ranging from $2 to $8, we see margins from 50% to 25% by year five. So we are ready to launch today, and we've identified two key upfront costs, the first of which is product development, which would be going towards refining the product in terms of fit and quality, and then of course launching our website as that will be our key channel towards our customers. So Alana and I met at Columbia Business School, and when we realized that our shared experience, Alana's in finance and mine as a designer, and both as a consultant to small retail brands, was the perfect experience to launch this brand. So we are super passionate about it, and we hope that you join us in our passion about Leoa and help us launch this pantyhose revolution. Thank you. Um, so I certainly look forward to a world where I don't have to buy pantyhose quite so frequently. Uh, I'm curious, where are you in terms of production, materials, design of, of these uh, Leoas or Leos? Um, so as I indicated, we basically um, have done a lot of research. I had an experience before school. I worked for five years as a designer, so I have a ton of product development experience. So we've gone out to factories, done a lot of research, found what's available. We've found that basically all the elements are existing in the market, but we're going to combine them in a unique product. So truthfully, we're looking for money to <laughs> develop a prototype but we've done as much as we can to get to the place at which we need to pull that trigger. So. Why hasn't anyone done this? Like, it, it seems like a pretty obvious problem. Why are there no high quality products that don't rip? Or are there products that are just really expensive? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's basically all of the incumbents in the industry right now, they've been around for a long time, so customers have a certain expectation of what they're producing, and it's very difficult to change that consumer perception. And in addition, this is sort of the core of their business model. It's based on repeat purchases, so there's not really an incentive for them to change. And in addition, a lot of these brands that are out there, they don't focus on pantyhose. So for example, Calvin Klein sold in department stores. They have a line of pantyhose, but that's not their core product, so they don't focus on this. We're, we want to be the niche player in this market. You said that there were, uh, they were 50 cents per wear, right, the Leos. Um, what is leading to the repeat purchases if they never run? What is leading to the repeat purchases if they never run? Yeah, so we're going to have different brand, like different colors and styles, so different levels of sheerness. So you can buy nudes, blacks, and eventually we'll do different designs. But in addition, pantyhose are also like socks. You can't wear socks forever even though they won't tear. So we believe that because people have such a great experience with them, even though they last longer, they'll still come back to buy their, their pairs. And in addition, women wear them you know, five days a week at work. They need more than one pair to... Uh, sorry. Yeah, just go to work. <laughs> yeah, just go to work. <laughs> how, how will you guys solve the sizing issue? Try it before you buy it type problem. Yeah, we're going to definitely put a lot of money into the product development, so a lot of testing with current consumers so that they understand, so that we understand the best fit and doing a lot of different sizing elements. So eventually launching a petite line or a plus size line for different people of different heights and different sizes. So I'm happy to be a beta tester. <laughs> um, you, you mentioned that um, direct to consumers is your, your primary channel, but have you been in talks with any other distribution um, stores, you know, Macy's, Bloomingdale's, department stores, or, or being featured on other, other e-commerce sites? 
Yeah, we definitely think that at the beginning, we'd like, just like to start with the e-commerce because we think we want to control the whole purchase experience and make that something memorable that will keep these customers coming back. But later down the road, we'd like to partner with, for example, home shopping networks, we think is a key channel and one that would really leverage the brand out there. And looking into maybe mass retailers because this is a mass market product, we would definitely look into that later. But at the beginning, it's very expensive to do that and we like to control the experience. If e-commerce is the channel that you're going to target uh, most heavily initially, um, are either of you engineers? No. no. That's not, that's, what I would suggest is that one of you learn um, yeah. or find someone who shares the passion for this project as much as you do. Because one of the things you'll find is you can pay a design shop um, or an outsource shop to build a website for you, but it will never be what you want it to be. And you'll never be able to iterate it on, on it as rapidly as you will need to to really, really grow. Um, so, like, the product itself seems like something that everyone's going to want, but you want the website to also be something that everyone's yep. going to want, and you want to control that. So I'd, I'd encourage you to learn to code. Definitely. Thanks for the feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. My name is Dan Mearns. I'm the founder and CEO of Merchant Fuse. Many of you are probably familiar with the Consumer Electronics Show. It's the largest trade show in the United States. It takes place every year in Las Vegas. There are over 150,000 attendees and more than 3,200 exhibiting companies. If you're a buyer attending the show and you want to get more information about one of these exhibitors on the website, this is what you'll find. It's a relatively, for lack of a better word, lame, one-dimensional directory with links to a floor plan. Now this website gets hundreds of thousands of unique visitors every year, many of which are in a highly targeted demographic with significant spending power. This is a real missed opportunity by CES to engage their audience and to drive exposure to their exhibitors. Another trade show I'd like to tell you about is called the American Made Show. It takes place in Washington, DC. There are about 800 exhibitors. If you go to their website today, this is what you'll see. Pretty similar to what we see on the CES site. But if you go back in about three weeks, this is what you'll see. This is the American Made Show Network powered by Merchant Fuse. Merchant Fuse is a white label platform that enables exhibition organizers to create engaging networks around their shows, including the ability to create e-commerce around their shows. Buyers can go on the site, they can search, browse, and filter by category, price point, country of origin, and more. If e-commerce is enabled, buyers can place orders directly on the site and pay with a credit card. Exhibitors get visually appealing profile pages where they can feature their products and get exposure 365 days a year. And exhibition organizers get a robust analytics panel where they can track trending products, trending companies, search terms, and more. We launched over a year ago with a different model. Originally, our goal was to create our own wholesale marketplace in the home and gift space. We attracted nearly 2,000 companies to join our network, but we faced a lot of challenges in terms of monetizing. So in January of this year, I started calling trade shows. And in February, we signed a deal with our first show. Last week, we signed up our second show. We're, uh, these shows are paying approximately $2,000 a month to use our platform. We're also in talks with one of the largest exhibition organizers in the UK. Next week, a team at the company will be presenting Merchant Fuse at an executive meeting. We're projecting to have five shows using our platform by this summer. We're also going to launch a paired. Uh, we're also going to launch a pared down, ba more basic platform with, at a lower price point. We're projecting to have over 10 shows uh, using our network by early next year. And in the future, we see an opportunity to launch a network around consumer shows. Looking at the market, there are approximately 31,000 exhibitions globally every year. This is made up of 4.4 million exhibiting companies and 260 million attendees. When we look at what organizers spend on technology, it's an approximately $1 billion market size. We see an opportunity to increase the market by introducing more effective display advertising and fees around e-commerce. There are a couple of other companies operating in this space. 
Some trade shows have developed products internally, and while they serve a similar purpose, they're nowhere near what we offer in terms of functionality. Our closest competitor is a company called Balloon, but our platform is much more highly customizable with limited setup required. We actually went head to head with Balloon with our second customer that we, that we signed up, and we ended up winning that business. Just some background on our team. My own background is in the retail industry. I worked in buying at Bed Bath & Beyond for a number of years, and I attended many trade shows. I'm also a, uh, or I, after that I attended business school here at Columbia. I'm also a web developer. My partner, our CTO, Zaki, has over eight years of web development experience. Previously, he built a dating website, and most recently he worked as a developer at Wireless Generation. Thank you. Hi. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you determined your price point of uh, $2,000? Um, so, we kind of just felt, felt it out. We actually are charging slightly less to our first customer, but our second customer are charging more, and I would like to be able to increase it further. Uh, it's really just seeing what the market will bear. Uh, so, a lot of these, as I said, these shows have actually built products that are like this internally, and, and they're nowhere near what, what we've created, and they've spent a lot more money than that. So that's kind of what we were basing it on. Uh, one, more, one more thing. Have you thought about monetizing the e-commerce aspect? Yes. So the e-commerce element is, so we're launching two networks currently with, with two shows. We're actually not incorporating e-commerce with them. Uh, it's, it's somewhat of a new thing for their attendees and exhibitors to just start doing business online, and it's not something that they want to force down their throats. So it's something that both of them have expressed great interest in creating in the future, and for us, it's really just an, as easy as flipping it on. We can just flip it on, and it's on the site one day. Um, but we... Um, yeah, and so when we do that, we would definitely want to monetize it. There'll be revenue shares around that. How long does it take you to set up a relationship with each of the trade shows? And then what's the cost for you of, of setting up that, the, the e-commerce platform? Yeah, so the American Made Show, the first time I reached out to them was on February 5th of this year. We had a signed deal on February 28th, uh, which was a lot quicker than I expected. But they really wanted something like this. They had been looking to create this, and, and it was just great timing. Uh, our, our second deal actually went down almost a, as quickly. So uh, the, the sales cycle is not very long. And we've structured our platform so that it's very easy for us to, to flip things on and off and customize uh, w without a lot of setup time. When people are buying, um, or I guess when you were a buyer, when you would go to a trade show, um, and then you were going to buy an item, say a humidifier, would you, go, how would you go about doing that? Would you directly contact the vendor and then say, I'm going to buy 10,000 or 100,000 of these units? And do you expect, and do you then expect, if that's the behavior, that that's going to transfer to the website? So trade shows are really about discovery. Uh, it, as a buyer, I had existing relationships. I had guys that I knew could, could produce whatever product, but there are always new products out there, new companies creating innovative things like Liao probably will be in, you know, they'll be at a trade show being like, look at these awesome things. So it's about discovery, it's about driving more exposure to those companies, and it, the, the trade show serves a very useful purpose, but it's only three days. CES has 3,200 companies, how can you possibly wrap your head around that, and why isn't there a resource online for that? So it's probably more about people who were at the trade show but didn't necessarily see everything to be able to discover new products rather than products they saw at the show? Well, it's about it's having a resource year-round and, and giving the trade shows a way to engage their audiences year-round. Have you thought about charging a percentage of sales run through the platform? Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, that would be kind of the, around the revenue share that we, that we would create. Um, like I said, we're not jumping into the e-commerce element just yet. Right. It's, it's what all the trade shows want to do, but they don't want to force it. Thanks. Thanks. Can we have a